And uh, this uh, working group is organized by uh, these members. Uh, this working group is uh, organized by these members. And uh, first, I, and, uh, I'm uh, Hideki Nagano from NICT Japan. Uh, I will chair this, uh, today's session. Uh, um, first, I would like to uh, introduce uh, our, uh, this working group. And uh, the objective of this working group is to share experience to design, manage, maintain, and protect the network using artificial intelligence technologies and uh, escalate uh, collaborations for AI-driven networks in uh, APAN communities. And, and today, we, uh, we uh, have the four presentations. And uh, uh, the, the presentations are, are like this. So now uh, we would like to start, uh, I would like to start uh, today's sessions. So the first uh, speaker is uh, Mariam Kiran uh, from uh, Oak Ridge National Laboratories. And uh, Mariam, uh, can you share your slides for everybody? Uh, yes, I'm ready. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, if, okay. Uh, I need you to stop sharing. Okay, now I can share. Okay. Can you see my slides? Yes, please. Yes, okay. it's, good. it's good. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so uh, thank you again for this opportunity to let me talk uh, about our recent work. So I've been uh, doing these uh, sessions with uh, APAN with this group uh, for, for a few times now and we were talking about AI being implemented on optic networks. And last month, what happened was I was offered a new uh, position to head up the quantum networking uh, group at Oak Ridge National Lab. So I've actually moved from Lawrence Berkeley to Oak Ridge. And uh, Dr. Song and uh, Dr. Hideshi thought it would be nice uh, to talk about the new quantum work I'm doing uh, as well. And hopefully we're going to be putting AI in this. So I hope that we can continue this group and this collaboration to come and talk about this and hopefully have some opportunities to collaborate. Um, so uh, yes, yeah, so with me, uh, so I'm Mariam Kiran. I am a, a research scientist using AI for optimizing and making self-driving networks, particularly in optical networks. But as I mentioned, now I'm also leading up the quantum networking uh, uh, division at Oak Ridge National Lab. So I'm trying to see how that principles can be moved into quantum. Um, so in this particular talk, I focused on what quantum networks are and what are the challenges we are looking at for science uh, so that I can entice the group uh, to start looking into this as well, because it does seem like this is going to be the future. Um, so this is the outline. Uh, I'll start with why are we building a quantum network? Um, and we also did some work on 5G. So I've kind of put those use cases in here so you can see the difference and why uh, science is moving in both of these directions. Some of the challenges we are seeing in quantum networks, I just joined this group. So there are some things they've implemented and some things that are still being implemented. Um, so I'll talk about those and then the use cases which we are working on as well. Um, and then I have an example of an AI uh, application in quantum networks, which I'll go into in detail. So um, we, as research networks, uh, whether it be in America or a the APAN community, and we are basically designing networks for universities to use um, for science transfers. So most of us work in the wide area network space uh, where we are deploying optical networks and we're trying to make sure that the network is optimized for science movements. But what we see, uh, particularly in America or in the DOE space, I'm seeing a lot more wireless work happening where science is moving out into, uh, into the wild, where we're deploying sensors, be it Raspberry Pis or FPGAs, where they could do real-time edge control. 
They could do drones for emergency uh, corrections or collection of data. They're writing AI for applications at the edge. So this is an example where, uh, 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 if you can see my cursor here, this is an example where they have a real world, a real world field experiment where they're observing uh, ecology kind of uh, bacteria or something which is growing in the wild. And they are building models off of this so that they can actually do some tests in the modeling world. Uh, this allows a scientist not to actually go out physically into the, into the desert, for example. They can actually bring this data out into a model and they could do a lot of AI to actually get data into it. Now, just within the space, you can see from a networking point of view, as we're network researchers, this brings wireless networking challenges, which we now have to cater to for scientists. So we have to think about latency, we have to think about throughput, uh, we have to think about the battery power of the sensors as well, because this information is now being gathered and you are actually bringing this data in to fuel those models in which you're doing research. So this is where 5G is now becoming very uh, attractive. And they expect us as network researchers to have a 5G a uh, system available for scientists to use. Um, then at the same time, there is a boom happening in the quantum world as well. Um, so quantum is, uh, we thought a few years ago that this is just gonna be a phase, but it's becoming more and more realizable now. Um, so a lot of the labs are buying quantum computers and they are deploying them. And then Connecting these quantum computers is also becoming a major challenge from the networking point of view. Um, so you can Im imagine, for example, in this particular diagram, we have Alice as one computer and Bob as another computer, which is a quantum computer. And in this particular case, they are doing quantum key distribution. So they basically exchange keys and they secure the channels. So this could be classical channel or quantum channel, and then they actually share information in this. So some of the challenges which in science we are seeing that distributed quantum states, like how do you distribute this across a massive connection of different quantum networks is going to be a challenge. Uh, they're also thinking of what is the new science applications that are going to look like in this quantum world um, and uh, what more information can come from a quantum uh, rather than an optic. So I, I do explain what quantum and optic is in the next few slides. So the way quantum networks work is completely different. So they have to think about quantum entanglements because that's how information moves. They have to think about repeaters and they also have a completely different infrastructure that, that we are uh, aligning. And I think this is something which as network researchers, we should start working on now because uh, very soon this is, so right now, this is being dominated by the physicists in the world where they're deploying uh, and doing all of these experiments. But if we were to actually reduce this to engineering, then that's our domain. So that's where we would come in as network engineers and, and deploy this as, as an engineering exercise. Um, so both of these, wireless and quantum, are two major use cases which science is basically going to be taking off in, in these two worlds. Um, so, for example, in the 5G space, I have two slides showing how we're building a 5G network, for example. Um, ESnet is the DOE's wide area network, which I used to work with uh, about a month ago. Um, so we've kind of started to deploy AI on ESnet. But basically, in a 5G space, this is what uh, I'm still doing is how I can connect a 5G network to the wide area network, which we have. So you can replace ESnet with the wide area network, which you guys already have. So for example, if we go right to the left over here, where we have these user elements, which could be represented as Raspberry Pis or FPGAs or smartphones, where you're actually getting data. So these can become your sensors. That data comes into your base stations. Um, so these are also 5G base stations, which goes across a radio access network, which goes into a 5G core. Now your 5G controllers can sit over here and they can talk to the controllers in your wide area network. And that is how you can do an end-to-end -end 5G connection all the way up to your wide area network and eventually to other wide area networks as well. Um, why is this particular case important? It's because this way you can straight away connect your sensors out into the field 
all the way up to the data centers in your lab. Uh, so you don't have to physically go download the data and move the data across. So that is why having a thought on how this could be done end to end, you can have a continuous stream of data which is coming in to actually drive the models which are running in the uh, HPC systems. So this is a ORAN kind of a, a, a 5G uh, deployment, which is general enough, which anybody can deploy. And uh, this is uh, one of the suggestions that which we are currently working on. So we've actually started building this up. I'm a big pro proponent of open source and the cheapest we can get, uh, like devices and stuff. So for example, for the sensors, I'm buying Raspberry Pis with 5G hats, as you can see here. So these are the 5G antennas over here, uh, which can have all these sensors connected to it. And these antennas would eventually connect to the fire cell base station over here, uh, which allows us to actually control and co communicate with the controllers as well. Uh, we programmed our own SIM cards to actually do this connection as well. Uh, we used fire cell in this particular case is because it was open source and it allowed us to deploy our own controllers um, and also do a horizontal expansion. So I can add different kinds of devices and I'm not bought in by one particular company if I, if I went down that route. But now I'm doing a reassessment to see if Fire Cell is, Fire Cell is still the good uh, solution or should I go with other companies? So if people are interested in uh, collaborating on this, I am looking for people to work with me on this um, from a science point of view and how we can do 5G in the labs. Uh, so this is uh, a suggestion over here. So this was the 5G lab, but um, since moving to Oak Ridge, uh, which is the Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, this particular lab is actually located in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, the new movie Oppenheimer came out. So actually Oppenheimer talks about Oak Ridge because a uh, Manhattan project was, was actually done a lot on Oak Ridge. So uh, it's a good time the movie came out because it's easier for me to explain the work uh, and where I work now. So um, Oak Ridge has been deploying this Q quantum uh, LAN on campus. So as you can see, so there are four buildings over here, which we're naming Alice, Bob, Charlie, and Dave. Um, and we've set up routers and switches across. We've set up optic cables across these uh, labs. And what we're doing is we're sending quantum information on top of those optic channels. Um, so the group has, uh, this was before I joined, the group has actually done this and published a lot of papers in which they've physically demonstrated that the quality of the signal, even if it is uh, superimposed onto optic channels, is still very good. Um, so what this does is it opens doors for a lot of quantum work, because now we can reuse the optic infrastructure that already exists, put quantum information on top of it and send data across. There are some challenges like noise uh, and the quality of the quantum which is going. So that is something which they are currently working on. Uh, but uh, what it proves is, is that quantum networking is actually very much possible. Um, so we have a paper, uh, the group has a paper where they have described how they've done this. Um, so I'm trying to, uh, do these slides in a way where I can bring this information to this group at APAN and then hopefully entice you all to start working in this area. So uh, quantum networks is basically you're thinking of rather than sending bits as we do in optical channels or optical uh, networks as we work, we're sending qubits instead. And what qubits are is that they represent the spin of the electron. So rather than having zero and one, you can have more information being represented as you are sending it across. Um, right now, this field is very nascent because they have not defined what the data plane and the control plane looks like. And there is a lot of experiments which show very small proof of concepts, but not a large scale network. Um, so how it's actually going to exist is, so for example, I took ESNet's picture at the bottom over here, which is a wide area network, which we know uh, very well, uh, which spans from all the way from California, all the way to Europe over here. And what happens is that they sit quantum computers on specific nodes, 
and that quantum information do whatever they want to do. And that qubit information can be converted into bits. And then those bits can use the optic channel to be sent across. So that's one way of doing quantum network uh, distribution where you can actually use the optic network uh, if you want to just uh, convert yourself, or you can also do the qubit conversions. So I have another diagram which explains that. Uh, but this procedure of converting quantum information to optic information is called quantum transducers. Um, so this is where AI has actually been successful. So we used quantum computers that were sitting on top of fiber optic and we did all the quantum exploration in that. And once the quantum information was ready, we converted it from quantum to optical frequencies. And then we used that onto the optic channel to send information across. Uh, one of the major challenges in this approach is that the conversion is actually not very good at times. Uh, the quality, you lose a lot of the quality of the signal when you do conversion. So here we used um, AI reinforcement learning to, uh, to build a DDPG actor critic algorithm to actually improve the conversion rate. And our simulation showed that we were able to achieve up to 60% of efficiency in the conversion rate, which was better than Google's experiment because Google has also been looking in, at the same problem. Uh, but we do see that although we can prove this in theory, actually doing this in practical, it's diff difficult because we have to write an FPGA which can do this conversion. And right now we don't see how this can be done practically. Uh, so quantum transducers is a way, but we're also moving away from this particular approach uh, to do qubit to optic conversions. So another approach of using quantum networks is quantum sensors. So as you can see, again, we have an optical network which is sitting at the bottom, which we know very well. We have routers all connecting all the way. And th this is a very typical classical network where we have uh, source and destinations being uh, defined. Then you have a quantum uh, network sitting on top of these particular routers. So all the quantum states that are generated at the top can then be converted into optical information and then use the network below to send information across. So there is a lot of new research for us as network engineers because we can write those protocols that are going to be um, that are going to be interfacing between the qubit and the optic, and that's new nascent research for us. There's also distributed quantum computing, which we can introduce through this concept. In DOE, there is accelerators and detectors, and there is talk that they are going to be replacing those with quantum accelerators. So you can imagine that rather than having just the zero one information that is being recorded at the edge, now you will have qubits recording a lot more information. So this is called ghost imaging in quantum and quantum sensors. So if you record all of this information in quantum, you need to communicate this information in quantum as well. So that also brings new challenges for quantum networks to make sure that we're all connected. Um, Another challenge which quantum networks currently sees is clock synchronization. So uh, although we've kind of solved this problem in 5G sensors and other wireless sensors, uh, quantum network has not solved this problem. So this is a very hot topic uh, in, in uh, the quantum world where they're trying to build clock synchronization across quantum networks. This is again, the same principle. You're gonna have sensors distributed across large distances. How do you make sure that they're all synchronized and all the data which is coming is at the correct time? Because right now they haven't defined even what a flow is gonna look like in quantum networks. So again, there is a lot of uh, opportunity for new research. Uh, currently what uh, we've been doing is we've actually ran a simulation of this clock synchronization on a quantum network. And we're trying to see how this can be simulated and made optimal. Uh, but the problem is because reality quantum networks don't exist, you cannot verify the simulation with real data. There are many simulation platforms that exist. So which one do you do? The one we used was we wrote one in Python from scratch. Uh, but this is a very important problem that needs to be solved for distributed quantum sensing experiments. 
So this is another area which uh, is currently open for research. Um, so another uh, challenge which is currently being looked at is quantum memories. So quantum used to be that uh, the whole concept of quantum is the um, if you observe the qubit, you lose the information. So quantum memories is basically you're trying to store qubits, which has until now, uh, people thought it was not possible, but there are a few groups who have started developing quantum memory. Now, this looks very similar to how we have buffers in networks where a flow comes and then you store it in a buffer for some time before it can go forward. Uh, I, When I see this diagram, I see that. Um, so that when Alice and Bob are doing quantum information exchange over a noisy, turbulent optic channel, they can have this quantum memory, which could actually be the buffer where certain things can be stored until information can go. Um, and then once they are um, good to go, so they can be entangled. So entangled is how information moves in the, uh, in the qubit world. And that's uh, how this information works. Um, so this is, uh, I put this diagram here to show you that as network engineers, we can see certain things because we've been designing networks from our, our undergrad days, for example. When physicists are working on this, they don't see these things because they've never designed a network. Um, so they don't see how the physics they are designing can be one-to-one -one translated into a, a quantum network. So I definitely think that this group, which we are all here, should start working in quantum memory because uh, quantum networks, because there's a lot of uh, things which we can use from the things we've already learned and convert them into quantum perspectives. Um, so in my group, uh, one of my uh, early career scientists, Joe Chapman, is designing things from the ground up. Uh, I just put this diagram here to show you how complicated things are because they are doing all of this on FPGAs and designing all of these systems. Uh, they, they have time synchronization points. They have checks. They have fidelity checks to make sure that the quantum qubit information is correct. The lasers they are using is also uh, being configured over here. So there, this is purely a physicist diagram, which I have to see every day. And then I have to see how this can be converted into a network. Um, so where is the routers and where is the switches in, in here? So there are lots of things which we are looking at right now. Um, so the other challenge which uh, I found is that in network measurements, we are used to certain kinds of monitoring data sets. We have SNMP, which we know what it is, Perfsonar, throughput loss, jitter, NetFlow, which is our flow records. We have TSTAT for TCP data, and we have more. I just listed four here. In quantum networks, you have a different kind of monitoring system because now you are measuring the quality of the qubit, which is known as fidelity. You're measuring the loss across the quantum channels. Uh, you're also measuring frequencies and the frequency conversions. So there are different monitoring sets in quantum world, uh, which again, we as network engineers can come in and help them to see what we should be monitoring as well. Because they don't do a continuous monitoring of a network because they just turn it on when they do their experiments and they turn it off. But if we want to really realize this quantum network, you can imagine this is going to be on all the time, like we have our wide area networks. So what are the monitoring things which we need to be looking at in a quantum world is, in, is interesting for us as well. Um, so uh, there is a lot uh, which is worth exploring over here. Uh, continuous monitoring using Persona for loss. So we could reuse some of the stuff which we are doing in the classical world in the quantum world. Um, and how is the quantum quality being used? Currently, we see uh, there is a famous example. I think China was actually able to demonstrate quantum network using satellite communications. Uh, so that means eventually we have to move into that realm as well. Uh, but we are currently working on a QLAN with quantum sensor setups and then eventually connect to, connecting through satellites. Uh, I Because I just changed groups and we're working in this field, I am very, very open for collaborations and I'm bringing it to this community to see if you guys are interested in joining uh, me in trying to push this forward where we can start bringing AI into quantum networks and also bring quantum networks into reality. 
Um, that's my email address. So please reach out to me and uh, thank you. Any questions? Stop share it to see because I can't see anyone. Okay. Okay, you guys are muted, so I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, hey, Miriam. Uh, 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 uh. Ah. <laughs> How do you? How do you? Uh, hi, Miriam. Hi, Miriam. Hi. Uh, oh, okay. you have to off the um, speaker. You have to off the speaker from there. Let's pull you down. Yep, could you try again? Is it okay? Hi, Miriam. Hi. Uh, can, hi. You, can you hear me? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. It's uh, in the network in this room with. Uh, has some problems, so I talk in in uh, it, uh, in front of the notebook, laptops. Uh, this is Bu Sung-jo from the Kisti, uh, Creonet. Uh, <laughs> I know you uh, well as uh, 
I congratulate you for the, <laughs> moving to the Oak Ridge. Uh, just I'm just uh, curious about, and it's very interesting talk over there. So, uh, Kissy, we are also to try to the, the, do the, some research to the quantum network and the 5G and the time synchronization with uh, optical fibers. So especially I am interested in the, the clock synchronization using the, the quantum sensing. Uh, we are the, now we are the, for the synchronization the timing, we are using the one optical fibers to the uh, to transfer the optical frequency. Uh, that is the accuracy, the 10 to minus the 17 we are uh, we were thinking about it. So could okay, you tell okay. me, yeah, could you tell us about the, what's the, the the benefits over the quantum setting for to the time synchronization for the in terms of the accuracy? That is a very uh, what I know about it. Uh, uh, sure. Uh, sure. I think, I think there is uh, uh, mine is uh, is there an echo? No, it's fine. Can you hear me still? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, so from what I've, uh, so since I've joined, what I they have told me that they have not done quantum uh, clock synchronization. So what you are telling is that you guys are actually a little bit ahead. Yeah. Uh, um, the what I've seen over here is that they haven't been able to achieve anything in the synchronization thing. So I think it would be good for us to talk. Because uh, I can invite you guys to come and do a talk to the group uh, and see if uh, we can learn from you guys and we can show what we have the other other parts of our accuracies, so we can discuss those. Yeah, and the uh, so the your the uh, your last part, uh, we didn't heard about your last uh, part of the presentation because uh, our is uh, has a problem, but. Uh, the message is that you are uh, easy to uh, collaborate to developing the, the monitor the quantum network. And so maybe the case also should uh, interest in that part. So I will wait to contact you about that thing. Yeah. Sure. So yeah. I'll just write down your email address so I'll I'll contact you. Yeah. Okay. okay. Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, so, uh, any other questions? Right. So, I have a um, questions. Uh, it it is also uh, about the time sync. Uh, time synchronizations, I guess, and uh, for in your systems, the uh, time synchronization is uh, evaluated by using the simulations on traditional networks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so you are uh, simulating the uh, quantum communications uh, on the uh, traditional networks. In such case, uh, how uh, how accurately can the system uh, simulate the uh, time synchronizations? So, yeah, so we're making a lot of assumptions. Uh, where where we don't know the accuracy, we're doing a lot of assumptions because we don't have any verification process and how we can verify that our uh, simulation is correct. But we've uh, based it off of mathematical formulas based on Poisson distribution. So we're using that to build our simulation and simulate it across. So uh, that's one of the challenges which we are trying to do is how to verify our simulations. OK. Um, thank you. And uh, any other questions? So I have one more question. And, uh... I guess the uh, and uh, for the uh, quantum computers, you are using the actual quantum computers, mm -hmm. and uh, but I guess that the the current uh, quantum computers are 
the, the, the resource of the current, com quantum computer is quite limited, I guess. Uh, what kind of uh, quantum computers are you using? Okay. And, uh, so, if yeah. you tell me the, would you tell me that, so the specifications of such, uh, that computer, quantum computers? Okay. Yeah. So in my group, we don't actually have a quantum computer. We are, we have quantum uh, detectors. So we've we've put quantum detectors like at the edge in a lab, and we are assuming that these are connected to our network, and we are working on the quantum network part of it. Uh, but we don't have like quantum computers and specifications which we're working with. So we're very separate from the quantum computer group. So there, so there is like this very physical separation. So we say that we're only on the networking field and we're just making sure that Alice and Bob are communicating. Um, eventually, once we mature, we're going to be starting to connect to quantum computers. Okay. Thank you. So any other questions? No? Okay. Yeah. So the, thank you very much, uh, Kirian. Um, no, Maria. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's go to the next presentations. And the next presentation is oops, uh, the okay. The next presentation is and uh, the uh, title is Network Intelligence Researches uh, Utilizing AI in Creo Nets. And the talk will be presented by Min Zhao Zhang. Oh, uh, the Min Zhao Zhang, uh, are you ready? Okay. Right, uh, please prepare the presentation. Thank you. Could you hear me? Yep. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Hi, I'm Min Seok Jung from Kisti Korea, and I'm my company Kisti. I run Squarenet and run Squarenet S as a SDN network. And many of the all oh, the jobs of the and slides are from the Dong Kyung Kim, the last man. And thank you for him. Yeah, but he's busy now, and that and that's why I'm here to present. This slide, uh, this presentation, and I introduce recent uh, network intelligence uh, using Creonet S. And then at first, I introduce what is Creonet S is. Uh, Creonet S has data planes. Uh, Kisti has about twenty pubs, local pubs, and several uh, external pubs at a board and. Kernet S is composed of SDN switches at Daejeon, Seoul, Busan, and several sites in Korea, and also in Chicago, Seattle, and Chicago in US and Hong Kong. So Kernet S is a global wide SDN test bed, and it has global wide data plane. And did you know what controls that data plane? Uh, Planet S uses Onos Open Network Operating System as a SDN controller, and it is open source project under uh, the Linux Foundation. And Onos is a platform and a set of ap applications that act as an extensible modular distributed SDN controller. And on top of Onos, SDN uh, Planet S create BDN services. Onos has lots of uh, services, networking slicing, forwarding, SNIP, virtual lock, DHCP, and lots of functions. And Creonet S added we Oh, but now, now I'm working, but yeah.
Um, yeah, it's sharing, yeah. Ah, crashing windows. <laughs> Yeah, wait a minute. Recording in progress. Yeah, then yeah. wait, yep. Yeah. Can I continue? Yep. And all nodes has a lot of features, like those features and current and S added VDM function. And VDM function offers dedicated network resources between two hosts, two end to end hosts. And using those functions. Uh, Cranet as a creator to use those functions. Uh, you may know container service like Kubernetes. Uh, it allocates compute and storage resources. Also, it can possible to allocate simple IP network IP to the services. Then, if if you want to attach a public IP to a service, then you may use load balancer in Kubernetes. And Conventional container orchestrator allocate the allocate those three types of resources, but there are no network resource optimization between two hosts because there's a lot of switches and routers in in the past. And Kubernetes as orchestrator can offer a VDN in this case, so it can allocate compute storage and Network resources on a specific network path. And VDM path competition el element, compute optimal path and allocate dedicated network resources among two sites dy dynamically. And those information and logs are stored in the database for future use. Now, Cryonet S expand to the wireless network. So you may see this picture. And KIST has several buildings and the main building and the supercomputer building, we connect by 10 gig wireless link. Uh, this is the Edge Core 60 gigahertz Wi-Fi AP. Uh, it has four radios and each radio has page array antennas in each side in each side because the square has four sides and each side and each radios can reach up to 30.8 Gbps, up to 300 meter. This is the installation of eight APs and four is in the supercomputer building and four is in the main building. And this configuration makes four wireless link between two buildings. And 60 gigahertz radio wave has similar features like laser or light. Now it propagates through the air in a straight manner. The interference is not significant, it's very small. This is why this is, this is the region that they can install closely. Now this is a figure of topology of APs in the owner's controller uh, shown in the previous slide. Uh, it has four links and those APs is funded by this tab of data city. That's why uh, the naming is not a KST or super computer building. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we have to show to the this tab. <laughs> and anyway, this is a performance test result. And personal test is done on the single wireless link and it shows about two gig BPS. 
the each line has 10 gbps but i need to optimize those wireless link later and network embedding is used to apply reinforced learning in VDA resource allocation problem. Uh, okay. Uh, Credit S try to apply reinforced learning based uh, decision making algorithm on the VDN power management. Oh. I am sorry for the network interrupt. Recording in progress. Volume down, please. Volume down on the death screen. <laughs> You, you may. You, you may. You, you may. Yeah, it has all speakers. Okay, Crayonet, uh, I continue. And Crayonet S try to apply reinforced learning based decision making algorithm on the VBD and allocation problem and power management problem and close resource orchestration problem. And network embedding is used to apply reinforced learning in VBD and resource allocation problem. And network resources can be represented as a matrix form of multi dimensional space. And it and it is used as an input of neural network or, or, or algorithms. You may know that a network topology can be represented as a adjacency match matrix. And sorry for interrupt. Mm -hmm. Maybe can I use my laptop? The HDMI port? Ah, small, ah, full one. It's not detected yet. Progress. 
예. 음, 혹시... 혹시 갈래픽스 호텔 비번 알아요? 그 종이 진짜 그때 다 모르죠. 아이고. 예. 예. 어, 어, 예. 예. It has some delay, but. 어, it has lots of delay. <laughs> but then. Yeah, anyway, I continue. And a network embedding is used to apply reinforced learning in BDN resource allocation problem. And network resource can be represented as a matrix phone. And you may know the network topology can be represented as a adjacency matrix. So BDN request for end to end dedicated path is represented as matrix and current network resources are also represented as matrix. And then reinforced learning can be applied to optimize those resources. And two, oh, yeah. Come on, <laughs> slow, yeah. And to apply reinforced learning in at the end for energy consumption. At first, uh, reward and penalty function would be defined. Then actions are applied on the state space on each epoch. And actions are BDN operations and switch sleep state mode, uh, switch sleep mode uh, like on and off. And state contains a network topology Gradient status and power consumption. Uh, likewise, for cloud resource optimization, a uh, reward action state should be defined. Uh, and we could launch containers on the server side. Because there are lots of sites, lots of sites that we can launch the containers, and selection of the site would be an action. Then reward would be the amount of some of allocated cloud resources, and penalty would be the link capacity. Because 
network resources is needed to integrate distributed containers. And state contains topology, VDN status, and host machine status, like CPU memory and storage. And for AI research on 5G networks, a Creonet con configures my uh, own 5G lab and collect data now. And data are operation data from SDN controllers and user request and allocation data. And those data would be used to analyze Creonet as 5G infrastructure, and especially on research on dynamic patterns of user and prediction of wired and wired network status. Also, I, I, I not in the slide, but we also widely predict wire ch channel status and uh, its per wire channels performance because we implemented the uh, wire connection between two buildings, and that's why uh, we installed automatic weather stations and getting uh, weather information, including humidity, temperature, and so on, to predict uh, wireless channel information the channel conditions. And KST is famous for National Supercomputing Center and Creonet and Data Curation Service. And uh, with those data from KST and from other institutes, uh, KST holds AI contest now. It is now in progress. And that, contain, that contest has lots of subjects. And each subject, for each subject, Kitty selected three teams to solve science and technology issues or local issues. And contest program committee at each sub department of Kitty for data and questions for the contest. Then I should have to select the data and problem. And there are lots of uh, various types of network operation data. And time series data, scalar value data is easy to predict and easy to apply network algorithms. So uh, AI algorithms. So I did not choose easy problem. Like for, but I think that AS path data is kind of a sequence data because it shows AS path so next top and next top and next top is kind of sequence. And actually I'm newbie of AI and I'm not familiar with, I'm not familiar with sequence data. And this is why I selected BGP data for the contest. And so I present MRT and RIP data and three team will develop their own AI solutions and they will give a detailed classifications of Status and visualization of BGP, BGP abnormalities. And this is the last slide of my presentation. And thank you for joining. Thank you. If, and if there are any questions. Questions? Thank you very much. I may have one quick question. Yeah. Uh, uh, you mentioned about the cloud uh, resource um, management by using the machine learning. Yeah. And in your slide, uh, you specify that the reward function be yeah. defined in terms of the link capacity. Could you like explain a little bit more why this choice of the reward? Uh -huh. uh, this one or power management or cloud management? Cloud resource management uh, cloud for the orchestration. Uh -huh. A penalty is a, you know the penalty is reasonable, right? Because but resource allocation because we try to allocate resource, but if the host machine status is enough, then we will allocate full user request. But the uh, if there are low, if there, there are few resources that if you request, but they will not give the resource. That's why if 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 I select a uh, close one, but there are a little few of there are uh, low data. I, what, what should I say? There are not, not enough data, then 
the request will be rejected, then it would be would, the then reward would, would be lower than if then other selection. That's why I select the amount of resource itself as a reward. Right. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? So I have one question. Yep. Um, generally, uh, the reinforcement learning takes a long time to converge. Yeah. So the the system uh, uh what will the system do in the running time uh, the meantime? Uh, for that one, but topology is very simple because we generally we use reinforcement learning for images and a lot of uh, big size a uh, big dimensional data but it is very small one so mm -hmm. it, it converts very fast very fast mm -hmm. all right so the uh, on the fly so you mean the and the, it will run on the fly very quickly yeah yeah okay thank you any other questions And uh, so I, I have one more question. Yes. Yeah. And uh, what kind of uh, SDN platform are you using? Maybe I think it's the very quick system, I guess. Pardon? I'm sorry. Uh, what kind of uh, SDN platform? SDN platform? So yeah. We use uh, for switch vendors or some controller. Uh huh. Uh, uh, we, we use controller as for Onos. Onos. And mm -hmm. we use switches from Brocade. Yeah, and I don't know the other vendors, but okay. mainly use brocade switches mm -hmm. for open flow. Okay. Oh, it's an open flow. Yeah. Okay. So, any questions? No? Okay. So, thank you very much. And then the, I'm sorry for the inconvenience on the system. So. Okay. And let's go to the next presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. And the next presentation is Federated Route Freak Detection in Interdomain Routing with Privacy Guarantee. It will be given by Dan Dan Lee from Beijing University of Posts and Telecommunications. It's, uh, uh, the, it's, the presentation will be on the virtual. So the, are you ready? Uh, Dan Dan Lee. Oh yeah, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, okay. so would you share your slides? Can you see my slide? Uh, okay, yeah, now I can see your slides. So okay. please start the presentation. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. It's my great honor to be here today. I'm Dan Dan Li from Beijing University of Post and Telecommunication, China. I'm going to talking about uh, uh, federated route leak detection in interdomain routing with privacy guarantee. Uh, my talk is divided into four parts. Uh, to begin with, we, I will uh, introduce federated learning uh, root leak and uh, why we use federated learning to solve the problem uh, root leak uh, detection. Um, then I will propose a method of federated root leak detection. After that, I will dis discuss the performance of all purposed method. Now, finally, uh, I will draw a conclusion. Uh, first, uh, uh, I will introduce federated learning. Um, with the development of LT, more and more LT devices uh, have entered the life of uh, people, uh, generating more and more uh, private uh, data. And uh, AI technologies uh, can analyze user data to facilitate people. Uh, 
um, which are stored money, intelligent applications such as smart healthcare, uh, intelligent transport. Uh, however, AI framework uh, need to collect user data to a central server, uh, which lead to uh, information leakage. Uh, in the feature uh, from bottom right, we uh, found that the here, uh, the here utility, uh, the worth, the privacy. A question arise: how to balance the utility and the privacy? Um, fortunately, one of um, answer is uh, federated learning. What is federated learning and how federated learning uh, work? Uh, in the uh, framework of federal learning, uh, there are two roles, central server, client. Uh, first, uh, each client performs model training based on local uh, design, uh, local site. Uh, second, uh, each client sends the chained model parameter to server, to central server. Uh, third, central server aggregate uh, receive model uh, first, the server sent the update model to each client to finally repeat a step from one to four until a uh, private data main condition is met. Um, compare, um, compare, compare with traditional machine learning, uh, the typical characteristic of federated learning is that the, the data uh, doesn't move and the model uh, does. Uh, next, uh, we uh, will introduce uh, a root leak. Uh, I think uh, this part is familiar to of us. As we know, the internet is composed of tens of thousand AS and is and they use BGP. Uh, they use BGP to exchange reachability information. The routing policies of AS for a path selection are business oriented. Common business relationship type uh, between AS include the C2P, P2C, uh, P2P. A uh, common routing policies in the internet is router learned from one peer to provider uh, can't be propagated to another peer or provider uh, called as wildly free rules. Uh, what is routing leak? Routing leak occur when an attacker propagate a valid router uh, beyond the scope intended by the routing policies of involved AS. Uh, uh, which means um, which means valid free rules. Valid valid free rules uh, is violated. Uh, routing leak uh, can cause a major uh, net network outage or bringing a, a risk of man in the middle attack. A uh, recently main root leak detection method has been directly shared uh, routing policies or business relationship. Uh, um, as we know, each AS only knows the relationship between itself and its neighbors, but it doesn't know the exact relationship of others due to privacy issue. Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, uh, uh, AS are unwilling to uh, reveal their uh, business relationship due uh, relative to others due to economic issue, um, complexity of routing policies, uh, and so on. Uh, uh, an important uh, question arises: How to uh, detect a root leak while protect the business relationship or privacy? Uh, privacy um, mean, means means. Uh, uh, means don't share a business relationship to others uh, under, under this con condition, how to uh, detect a root leak. Uh, next, I will give the uh, method. Um, as I mentioned above, uh, federated learning can keep training data local, uh, but uh, one um, weak point uh, is uh, a fixed uh, Third, third party, third party, or fifth third party, uh, then a uh, blockchain based federated learning, uh, learning is proposed which uh, can avoid a single point of failure. failure. Uh, the last uh, picture show uh, the framework of our method uh, that is FLRLD. Uh, in, this, uh, in this picture, uh, we can AM, AM. AM means AS chain manager. Uh, in fact, uh, AS 
each AS play roles as client of federal learning and uh, node in the blockchain. Uh, the, uh, the AM has at least uh, uh, two fees, including training, including training and aggregation. Um, it should be not, not, not uh, training data. Each AS transfers routing policies to AS triple uh, with label. AS triple uh, include AS uh, last hope, next hope. The label, uh, is, the label is generated uh, according to local routing, local routing policy, uh, including AS business relationship and the stable routing information base. The label is regular or malicious. Uh, next, uh, uh, we uh, will show a uh, work pro process of FLR uh, IOD. Uh, step one, AS, each AS obtain training task information, uh, including initial model uh, training epoch from a blockchain. Step two to step three, uh, AS uh, chain local model uh, locally and upload the local model to blockchain. Uh, step four to step five, uh, a certain AS aggregate all local model and, and then global update model is obtained. Uh, step six, the aggregate global update model is stored to a uh, blockchain. Uh, step seven, if the training can't satisfy first condition, step uh, uh, two to six are repeated. Uh, next, uh, we will discuss the performance of our purpose, uh, purpose method. Uh, first, uh, the BDP, the topology data is collected from the CAD uh, January uh, 2021 uh, uh, as relationship data set of IPv6, uh, which has uh, 12,721 as and uh, 173,462 as link. Uh, all choosing evaluation metric are Accuracy, recall, a uh, precedent, F1 score. Uh, TP and uh, FN are the number of true uh, malicious tri uh, triple uh, that the model predicted as malicious and uh, regular, respectively. Uh, the TN and FP are the number of true regular uh, triple that the model predicted as regular uh, and uh, malicious, uh, respectively. In the real network, since the number of provider, customer, and uh, peer uh, vary by AS, uh, then the number of triple and the label uh, class distribution of AS uh, also differ. Uh, therefore, uh, there may be a balance or uh, unbalance uh, in the uh, data size and uh, label distribution of uh, participant training data. data. Here, we select four group of uh, federated learning participate to test. Uh, group one represent unbalanced data size and a plus unbalanced class uh, distribution. Group two, balanced data size uh, plus unbalanced class distribution. Group three, uh, unbalanced data size uh, plus balanced class distribution. Group four, uh, balanced data size uh, plus balanced uh, class Distribution. The, this picture we show the performance or FLRD method compared with single S learning method uh, from C1 to C5. Uh, from this picture, uh, all method achieve uh, this point. To this point, uh, we uh, find that uh, all methods perform better than from C1 to C5 in all evaluation metric and a different group of data sets. Uh, next, uh, we compare with all methods, compare with uh, exact method. Uh, and uh, different and different uh, class, uh, label class, label class distribution. Um, we found uh, uh, all um, method and ML0, the performance is better than others. Uh, further, uh, all method perform better on average than uh, ML0. 
uh, furthermore, uh, we found the more uh, the more uh, malicious triple molecular triple uh, the better the better in um, the better detection result. Um, uh, based on uh, these, uh, this based on uh, this um uh, uh, result, uh, we uh, further discuss uh deployment strategy. Um, uh, here peer customer provider a peer strategy uh represent uh, AS with the most peer uh, deployed first uh, customer uh, strategy provider strategy uh, have uh, similar uh, definition. The x axis represent deployment rate. The y axis uh, represent malicious triple coverage rate. Uh, from this uh, feature. Uh, we found the peer deployment strategy can cover the most number of malicious triple than other two strategies with the same deployment rate. Uh, further, uh, we can get uh, AS with a large number of peer can be deployed with achieved better detection result. Uh, uh, finally, uh, we will draw a conclusion. Uh, our method can improve the performance of a single S in um, Detecting routing leak, uh, uh, and uh, with uh, privacy uh, guarantee. Uh, an important conclusion is uh, AS with a large number of peer uh, can be deployed by or method which achieve better uh, detection result. Uh, uh, that's all. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. So, are there any questions? Okay, so I have one question. And uh, I guess the differences as uh, experiments in the C1 represented as C1, C2, and so on. Uh, the, the differences as the data set used for uh, the each, uh, uh, each uh, C1, uh, C2, or C3. Right. Oh, sorry. I can't hear your. Uh... Sorry. And, uh, what, what the, so uh, you you performed uh, four uh, experiments, and uh, the group group one, group two, three, four, right? Okay. Okay. Uh, then what the yeah. difference as uh, the the among the these groups? You used uh, different uh, data sets for the learnings. Uh, this four, uh, this four group uh, uh, means okay. Short. Oh, wait a moment. Uh, uh, these four is four group. Uh, um, uh, data size means uh, uh, the number of uh, triple. Uh, class distribution means uh, regular, uh, the number of regular and uh, malicious, and uh, the number of uh, uh, malicious uh, label. Uh, uh, these four, these four group uh, um, uh, to show uh, different uh, uh, data distribution. Oh, I see. Okay. So the I'd like to ask one more question. So the and the, in your work process and the and the and the, the uh, aggregation process was uh, proceeded until the uh, fixed conditions are satisfied. And uh, would you tell me the objective functions and uh, used in the uh, aggregation process? Sorry, I can't. Uh, sorry, I can't catch your idea. Oh, so, and uh, maybe in the in the thread of the work process, would you show the uh, work process uh, slide off of the work process?
Uh, sorry, uh, would you show me the uh, slide for the work process, the algorithm of the federated learning? Uh, you mean deployment strategy? Sorry? Uh, you mean the slide of deployment strategy? Uh, the, uh, so uh, and I, I think uh, you have a slide for, uh, the title, the uh, first title is uh, work process and uh, the, you show the uh, step one, step two, and uh, step three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Uh... Uh, 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 you're focused on work work process. Yes. Okay. And I want to know uh, in the work process, and uh, in the at the step uh, seven, uh, you use the. Uh, the fixed condition to uh, stop the algorithm. And I want to know how did you define the uh, that condition? Uh, the fixed condition uh, represents yeah. uh, uh, the model coverage uh, or uh, training epoch, the number of uh, training epoch. Number of detection, uh, number of uh, leak detection. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Thank you. Oh, thank so, you. Any, yeah. Oh, any other questions? No. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And so let's go to the next presentations. Thank oh, you. Thank you. Uh, thank uh, you. So the uh, last presentation is uh, the uh, uh, the title is uh, Applying Machine Learning to Service Network Platform Control Current Progress. It will gi be given by uh, Hiroaki Harai from NICT Japan. Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. I can, can you hear me? And can yes. you see my screen? Yes. Good. Okay. So, okay, thank you. Uh, dear Epan, uh, AI Driven Networking Working Group Leader. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me this presentation opportunity. I'd like to talk about current progress in applying machine learning to uh, service network platform control. Uh, a uh, support of machine learning is a key to a uh, key role for proper automation and efficiency in multiple areas of control and management. So this is a presentation overview. So at uh, first, I talk about background of this talk and challenges. Secondly, I suggest machine learning application to service network platform control. Then I'll give application to network operation of the discussed method. So we have a plan to apply it to network operation in open testbed called Beyond 5G ICT testbed and conclusion. So my talk begins with future society. Uh, it's unpredictable. Uh, 20 years ago, uh, we couldn't imagine life supported by artificial intelligence and dependent on smartphone. So we challenged to imagine social life around 2035. So cybernetic avatar society and uh, city on the moon, uh, so on. So keys are development of beyond 5G. So it's together with realization of cyber physical system. So NICT published the white paper two years ago. So this figure is included in the white paper. So this is the image of the physical space at left and uh, uh, cyber uh, space at right. Uh, 
。So it emphasizes realization of cyber physical system that measure real world phenomena. So I mean big data. So project them into cyberspace, finds optimal solution and actuate the real world. So in the physical space, our network coverage will be expanded to non-terrestrial area. So uh, that beyond 5G can cover ocean and disaster area. So space coverage will be almost 100%. So we'll utilize terahertz frequency and uh, which goes beyond 5G, uh, beyond, beyond 100 gigabps. So large capacity optical fibers are installed in the core network. So in the cyberspace, data is collected by sensing at is analyzed. So many diverse applications like avatars, sky cards use such analysis. So we are designing a converged network of terrestrial and non-terrestrial networks. So this picture is a snapshot of our white paper, So, but I'll skip detail. So partial resources of them compose a service network as shown in the colored resources. So each service is assigned unique colored resources, for example, red, or blue, or green. So uh, each service is assigned unique color resources on a physical platform. So different service requests, a different QoS requirement, and network softwareization enables this resource reservation and partitioning. So this is a loss of uh, uh, softwareization in territorial. So network softwareization uh, technology logically builds a network meeting each diverse service and QoS request uh, on the same physical platform as I mentioned. So this is a contribution of network softwareization. So diverse devices and functions and data are increased. So it exists a diversified extreme service requirement. So working age population is reduced and CAPEX and OPEX should be kept. So to solve these issues, automation, elasticity, and agility are essential. So this figure is an example. So the two service is uh, continued and subscribers are produ and produce data increase as in time elapsed. So cloud uh, resources reaches congestion. So we have to automatically manage software network and IoT edge computing environment. So we have to elastic elastically and agilely expand computing and networking resources in response to service change of the event. So we expressed a new type of network control and management. So this is the introduction of machine learning. So this slide shows motivation for machine learning and application to service network. So service resources may short against time-bearing usage fluctuation and failure status. So we use machine learning uh, to an autonomic and quick management system. So we try to speed up processing by uh, minimizing the number of function change. So reconstruction for the target uh, services. So conventionally, for time varying fluctuation, applying sequential optimal uh, resources is one method. So, but it needs a large number of reconstructions. So moreover, if we provide optimal solution for future by ILP, so it requires hours to several days. Uh, because ILP uh, cannot be solved in polynomial time and due to the variability of target. So on the other hand, so in this work, we apply machine learning. So encoder, decoder, recurrent neural network. So our application process proposal uh, simultaneously achieves following. So it minimizes number of reconstructions based on the time service, uh, time series analysis, and it also determines location to migrate service function in second. So from many time, many time, re many time reconstruction to one shot translation like this. So I'll talk about AI enabled large scale network control automation technology for service providers operation. So in beyond 5G era, so network operation should be automated because we need for the complete automation to offer diverse services, fulfill their dynamically changing resource demands, and recover quickly from a potential failure. We should maintain and improve application QoS. 
For this purpose,、uh, we should monitor time bearing service performance, resource utilization, and available resources, network resources through telemetry. We also develop intent engines、uh, that、uh, translate service providers' intents into network configuration. And we want to、uh, develop advanced common management platform for inter AI cooperation. So we intend to、um, Develop networking of multiple vendors' AIs. So, this will be appropriate service management over multi tenant infrastructure. So, we aim to realize network autonomic control technology without human intervention in、uh, 2030s. So, I talk about machine learning application. So, this slide shows the overview of dynamic control of computing resource allocation for service network. So, we should maintain quality of services. For this purpose,、uh, we should use、uh, high、uh, efficient computing resources. So, speedy resource adjustment is also needed. So, judge should be in second. So, we achieve these simultaneously. So、that's why we study automatic AI based control. So, bottom figure is conceptual figure. So, service function chains are consist of a set of virtualized network functions that process packet transferred on the path between service and servers and clients. So, in order to keep satisfying the diverse quality of service requirement, We establish autonomic resource management framework. So, framework includes two parts、uh, monitoring and deploying AI. So, monitoring engine gathers,、uh, sorry, uh, monitoring engine gathers statistics of resource usage and traffic. And by using data,、uh, it predicts future demand、uh, by the regressor、uh, that has. The learning framework to keep its accuracy. So, regressors are based on the ensemble learning method,、uh, ensemble learning model. Long term and short term relearning method keep its accuracy、uh, despite、uh, trend change. And then, predicted demand is forwarded to、uh, the management engine. So, it includes the functionalities of resource arbitration within a server and FFC migration scheduler over the network. Automatic arbitration part allocates adequate computational resources uh, to uh, VNF uh, according to the predicted demand of them in、uh, each of the services. In the best cases, it uses resources with 30% higher effectiveness. So, if resource shortage、uh, that is hardly resolved by the arbitration,、uh, migration scheduler decides which and where VNF should be migrated to avoid the shortage. So, this scheduler is based on encoder decoder RNN. It solves the migration problem quickly、uh, despite a small number of cells. So, here I briefly address、uh, monitoring and analysis part AI. So, we are using long term and short term regressors for learning. Relearn,、uh, sorry,、uh, short term regressors for relearning. So, our prediction framework is based on、uh, ensemble learning. By using multiple、uh, relearning models,、uh, such as random forest elastic network and RN, we attempt to achieve better prediction performance. So, this framework consists of weak. And strong、uh, regressors. So we assume multiple weak regressors are trained on the central control unit、uh, by using the data set gathered from the whole of the network. So weak regressors are trained with the data set separated by some bugging technique. As a result, they are biased. The regressors are transferred、uh, to each server. So, and then, Each server selects adequate weak regressors by using the、uh, unique、uh, strong regressor. So, strong regressors are based on Gaussian process.、Uh, the server、uh, trains its regressor with data gathered by itself. 
So we propose the two-stage relearning mechanism for weak and strong regressors. They are called forgetting and dynamic ensemble,、uh, respectively. In the forgetting process, the weak regressors are periodically retained, retrained with the data gathered during the past few weeks or months. And the process is aimed to stay up to date with the changes in trends in long term scales. However,、uh, this process takes a long time for training, even if high performance GPUs are used. So we, we,、uh, we also introduce short time training mechanism and dynamic ensemble. In the dynamic ensemble process, the strong regressors are trained with the data collected on the server over the past few hours or days and when prediction accuracy falls. So this Process is designed for the adjustment of strong regressors to adapt to the changes in trend in short time scale. So, we evaluate the prediction performance for provisioning resources to virtual machines according to the prediction. So, trained data was three time zones, as in the previous slide, and we set the amount of CPU resources. To be 20% larger than the predicted value. So 20% is the margin. These figures、uh, show the probability of、uh, over and under provisioning、uh, during the 60 days. So the learning mechanism speci、uh, especially presents over provisioning. The probability is reduced by、uh, 75% smaller with comparing to the ARMA. Uh, auto regressive moving average model. And、uh, totally, the probability of the provisioning error reduces 45% smaller than the case of ARMA or RNA. Next, I'll talk about、uh, application to the network operation. So, NICT operates open network test of it for R&D purpose. So, you may know JGN. This is, one of, uh, uh, this is one that we operate,、uh, managed by Nagano san. So, the, since last October, so NICT launched、uh, Beyond 5G Reliable Virtualization Environment. So, I'll present this feature. So, we provide、uh, virtualized ICT service environment. So, highly reliable NFV equipment and software routers are dis、uh, distributed in test sites like that. So, the total number of virtual machines is 1800. So, these are migrated against failures.、Uh, that's why we say reliable. So, the, this is a service image、uh, provided in、uh, Beyond 5G Reliable Virtualization Environment. So, please look at the figure in the center. So, this is a user network called Station. So, it consists of multiple service VMs.、Uh, those may be in the same site or are located in different sites. The point here is reliable function to the users. So, that provides migration. Uh, and the backup functions of user environment in failures. So, we have a plan to transfer our developed,、uh, our explained control and management in, in beyond 5G reliable virtualization environment. So, that this will be,、uh, we have a plan, plan to transfer this technology to this environment. So, namely,、uh, monitoring. And demand predictions are done by machine learning knowledge. And resource arbitration and、uh, seamless migration in normal and congested conditions are offered. So, the, this is a current experimentation.、Um, before a trial in reliable virtualization environment, so we deployed a multiple cloud native network functions, CNF, on a computer resources in NICT testbed. So, we confirmed AI processing、uh, takes around two seconds,、mm. and CNF migration is from、uh, one minute through ten minutes. 
The same environment will be built on the Beyond 5G reliable virtualization and environment later. So, final is my conclusion. So, I presented machine learning application to service network platform control, so monitoring and deploying. And I introduced our application trial plan in Beyond 5G ICT test bed. So my talk is over. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Arisa. Uh, so are there any questions? OK, so I have one question. And uh, in your system, the, the training for the data and training data was uh, prepared uh, before the uh, applying the uh, system, applying the AI to the system. You train the uh, uh, AI before using it uh, in the PR system. Yes. Yes, so, uh, in that case, so we have previously uh, monitored the performance of CPU and mm -hmm. arranged it to the uh, gathered, for example, the daytime uh, gathering and the nighttime gathering and the 24 hours gathering, such kind of uh, many uh, data is uh, created. Oh, so uh, you use the, the... Uh, actual data uh, previously monitor, monitored, right? Yes, in this case, so we use the monitored data. And, of course, and in other cases, the another example, so that we are uh, using the uh, user's uh, uh, moving data, uh, who, who is yeah. which uh, access point of base station such kind of data is obtained so that we are monitoring and estimating the uh, user's uh, data transmission. OK, yeah, thank you. So are there any questions? OK. Uh, hi, this is uh this is Min Sok Chan from KST. Um, wow, I saw so the slide fifteen. Uh, you wrote about one thousand eight one thousand eight hundred VMs nationwide. And what is the purpose of those VMs? Pardon, performance. No, no. <clears throat> yeah. Oh, what what purpose of those VMs? Uh, in this case, uh, the we are uh, uh, this uh, large number of virtual machines separate and distributed users experiment, and uh, each VM uh, compose a network, and uh, some uh, network functions is installed in each uh, virtual machine to test networking. So that's why so we are uh, distributing this number of VM to Tensite uh, in order to make network. OK, thank you. Yeah, uh, like that. So this is a very uh, simple example. So that this uh, consists of three uh, node network. Okay. Oh, are there any questions? No. Okay. So, uh, thank you very much, and Harai san. Thank you. Okay. So, and uh, that's all for the today's sessions, and uh, I, I am I apologize as uh, for uh, the. Uh, I'm sorry for the inconvenience and due to the uh, network troubles, and so I could not uh, finish the sessions, and uh, and uh, I could not finish the sessions and at the until the expected time. But uh, anyway, and so I really appreciate for uh, 
the presenters and the, uh, the participants uh, who joined this session. Thank you very much. And uh, see you next time. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much.